It's a series of firsts and lasts for the Coast Guard in Alaska. Dog, you got the dog coming this time. In Kodiak, a rescue swimmer fights the currents to rescue four people and a dog in his last search and rescue. 35 knot winds were having a significant impact on the raft itself. It was increasing the distance that our swimmer had to move each time to get the next person. And in Sitka, it's a rescue swimmer's first hoist to a cruise ship as he rushes to a stroke victim in Glacier Bay. Going down. Patient definitely needs to be taken to a higher level of care. With any patient we have, chances are it's one of the worst days of their lives. Motor's coming up. The vast Alaskan wilderness, a place where beauty is cloaked by danger. Here every day, the highly trained men and women of the U.S. Coast Guard risk their lives to save others. America's deadliest waters are protected by Coast Guard Alaska. State troopers called. They do not have an asset um, on scene. It's going to take about four hours to get down there, so I think you're on your own. Lieutenant John Philipwitz, I got a call from a seafood processing plant relaying a mayday they heard on channel 16 from the vessel Ocean Viking. Uh, the Ocean Viking was sinking about 25 miles uh, south of Chignik, and they were getting into life raft with four people and a dog. So the crew is launching here from Kodiak. They just got airborne. It's about an hour and 15 minutes down to Chignik. The weather's good enough today to support a, uh, a straight line going over the top of the, uh, the island. Planning, we know where we're going. We've got four people and a dog and a raft. They did take an e with them, so we should be able to de to their position. They got to feel about our plan. I love it. Adequate. My name is Jason Bunch. I'm an AST-1 here at Air Station Kodiak. We moved with purpose with people in the water or people on a raft. We move with purpose on every launch. But to be honest with you, in the back of my mind, I really thought that by the time we got about halfway there, they would be picked up by another vessel. It was actually a surprise when we got halfway across Shelikov Strait and realized that there was no other boats out there. We were we were the only asset responding to that that Mayday call. How far off Chignik were they? Any idea? Distance from Chignik is about 25 miles. Stop. They're not swimming that. No, chances are they can't even see what direction to swim unless they got a compass with them. True. Do these guys have a survival suit or anything, do we know? I've not heard. You know, if we actually do pick these people out of the water, I don't know how big the dog is, but someone's going to have to probably hang on to them. So it'll be uh, somebody and a dog. Yep. Lieutenant Mark CV, H-60 pilot, Air Station Kodiak. I think everyone in the crew had uh, experience with hoisting animals before, so we had discussed it briefly and basically said that if the dog was going to come with us, it would have to ride up in the basket with one of the people from the vessel. The report of four people and a dog, first off, I'm a dog lover, so it didn't really matter to me if there was one dog or three dogs. The only thing is, if it was heavy seas and you have a dog, you might have your work cut out for you as far as getting them from the water to the basket. You never know how the dog is going to react in the water, especially if it's a large dog, 100 plus pounds, a lab. That's the first thing I think of is an Alaska lab. Well, we're getting tucked in next to the peninsula now. I got the peninsula land ho. All right, so uh, we should probably start looking left. We knew the winds were pretty strong, so we expected to see them downwind. So from about four miles out, we were able to proceed directly to the raft. Inside, out to the yeah. left. I got the raft. I think that might be them. All right, you ready for approach? Just yes, sir, ready for approach. Do I have door speed yet? Stand by, you're almost there. Basket, primary rescue device, unless I uh, call on the radio. Roger. Okay. Lieutenant Scott Woodcock, H-60 pilot at Air Station Kodiak. Once we saw the raft, there was a consistent 35 knot wind out of the west, so we immediately set up for an approach to the water. You have door speed. And door's open. And rescue briefing. This will be a sling deployment of the swimmer to the survivors. 
from 30 feet with this headwind. It'll be good at 30 feet. Question. 30 feet, good no question. That brief is complete. The plan was to use Jason right away, use the rest of the because the water temperature is so cold. We don't know if they got hurt coming out of the boat, if the temperature got them by the time we could get there. Roger, have target set. Someone's going out of the door for load set. Go down. I'm Jeff Broom. I'm an aviation maintenance technician, second class. I just recently became a flight mechanic. This is my first uh, hoisting case. Put him in the water, and he swam over the raft. We backed off a little bit, gave him a couple minutes, and then waited for him to go ahead and direct us to come on in and start commencing the hoist. Go ahead and hook up the uh, basket. Got it. All right, he's pulling the first one out of the raft, looks like. They're all in survivor suits. All right. Got the first one. Roger that. Out the south door. Once we got on scene, sea state was six feet maybe, but it was the current that created some difficulty. Um, getting the survivors all on, on board. Prepare to hit load, seek to load. Basket is out of the water. And you're through your easy left and halfway up. After the first hoist, we realized the rotor wash and the 35 knot winds were having a significant impact on the raft itself. And as it blew it further behind the helicopter, it was increasing the distance that our swimmer had to move each time to get the next person. On the second hoist, the raft had gone probably about 300 yards in just a few moments. So yeah, it, it took me a little bit of time to get to the raft a second go around. And uh, he's on the radio. He's on the radio. Here, Are you guys hearing him at all? No, I'm not getting that. Yeah, I got him. Okay. Swimmer 05, good copy. That's a good copy. Just you shake your head. Okay, what was that? Basically, what he wants to do is he's going to hold on to the basket a little bit and uh -huh. just drag him closer to the wrap before you pull the ball all the way up. We adapted our technique, and as we were bringing up the members, the rescue swimmer would hold on to the basket. We would then drag him closer to the raft, and then as he let go in a closer position, we would recover the basket with the person inside. Easy back and right. We're dragging the swimmer. And swimmer's away. Swimmer's in the water. Swimmer is OK. The pilots were able to move the helicopter back and right and kind of close the gap so I didn't have to swim so far. And it's about our captain getting out of the basket. After that, off we went. Got the next one out of the raft. Retrieved the third survivor. Came up, textbook, got him in the cabin, got him seated, and sent the basket down for the fourth hoist, which was the captain and their dog. Dog, you got the dog coming this time. OK. Dog and a person. Going down, basket is holding five feet in the water. The dog jumped right out of the raft. It was a lab, so we kind of expected that to happen. So I just grabbed the owner and put him in a cross chest carry, and then kind of stiff armed the dog and handed him to the owner, put the captain in the basket, the dog on top of him, told him to hang on to him, and up they went. Dog, you got the dog coming this time. OK. Dog and a person. Correct. That vessel sinking, four persons on board and a, and a dog. We were dealing with some pretty strong winds, so each time we put up a survivor, we had to reposition the helicopter, send the basket down for the fourth hoist, uh, which was the captain and their and their dog. Survivor coming up. Got a dog in the basket too. Dog is in the basket also. Basket inside the cabin. Is that the boat? Yeah, I got it right now. Right, that. And bring the inside the cabin. The Once we got in the helicopter, they all had their survival suits on. They were all dry. There was no medical attention necessary. So I told them to just buckle in for the hour and a half plane ride back to Kodiak. Good job, Jason. The dog doing well? Oh, yeah, he's loving life. It's always a treat to have a dog in the helicopter. Everyone's usually smiling and petting them and just thinking, wow, this is kind of weird. Everybody was just super happy that we were able to recover them so easily. That might be my last star case. That's a damn good one to uh, end it on. Yeah, well, we can share with you. All right, ramp arrival. Well, welcome back, gentlemen. Thank you very much, sir. 
Ambulance is going to be waiting for you. Uh, I just want the guys checked out before the release. Roger that. Anybody need to go to the hospital? No, I think we're all good. All right. Yep. Well, if we can, can we get you all in the ambulance real quick? We'll do yeah. a quick paperwork sure. deal and get out of here. Yep. Yeah. Let you guys. We don't, we don't got nowhere to go. But... We got nowhere. <laughs> we'll figure, we'll figure <laughs> that. Hey, we'll at, figure at that least out. you're here. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's the biggest thing. Yeah, absolutely. All right, appreciate it. Yeah. My name's Eric Wabe. I was a deckhand on the Ocean Viking. No, so we were taking some waves to the side of the starboard side pretty hard. So I kind of angled the boat towards that a little bit more. And then about, say, 25 minutes afterwards, I heard an alarm go off. Woke up the captain. We went downstairs. Noticed that there was water level rising pretty fast underneath the floorboards. I ran back upstairs to go tell everybody what's happening. Go back downstairs and the water level's over the floorboards now, about waist deep. So I start helping them muster, get everything up to the muster station, flares, EPIRB, survival suits. And then I go and run onto the radio and start for the Mayday distress call. Hey, awesome. Glad you guys can share you yourselves and made it easy for us. Everybody's good. This yeah, is awesome. Yeah. I turned the bilge pumps on and both of them. I turned both of them on and there's no way. I, I ran upstairs to see if the water was going over. It was. Yeah. And I went back downstairs. I'm like, <laughs> it's there, going. There, it's there's going. nothing we could do. Yeah. <laughs> My name is John Ness. I've been inspected. Everything was fine. All the sea chests got changed. Everything was like brand new. I never foresaw anything ever being a problem. When I left the engine room, I already knew that was it. I don't have the pumping capabilities to pump out that amount of water coming in. Well, at least you guys had all the right stuff. Yeah. Half the time. Well, we're so we're so worried about what was going to roll over. You know, like I, we thought it was going to roll over because it was sitting at the deck. You know, yeah. floated. I mean, just the house was kind of right. the house and the stern were sticking up. Well, you guys were prepared. Mostly, people well, aren't prepared, and it, it made everything easy. Yeah. You guys are safe. You're healthy. Yeah. No, nothing bad become of it as far as you know. All the all hands involved. This was the last case of my Coast Guard career. To end 13 years here in Alaska is pretty awesome to pull four people and a dog out of the water that were really prepared with an A-plus uh, air crew. You couldn't ask for anything better. It really feels good, and I'm pretty proud to have been a part of it all. Good boy. Today, we observe the retirement of Petty Officer Jason Bunch and recognize over 20 years of honorable and faithful service to our nation. I didn't want a big bells and whistles ceremony. I just want something simple. I came into the Coast Guard to be in aviation and to be a rescue swimmer. So when I leave the Coast Guard, I really want to just be surrounded by uh, my fellow aviators and my family who supported me through this career. Obviously, this is not the usual uniform we wear when we do a retirement. Uh, Jason wanted to retire in his swimmer gear, since that is what he spent most of his career wearing. So I think it's really great he's getting the chance to do that. While well, in Kodiak, he earned qualifications in all three aircraft and valuable experience responding to many different kinds of emergencies, uh, from bear attacks to plane crashes to people in the water. Jason epitomizes what it means to be an AST. And that's first and foremost. But he really took pride in the fact of being a, a, a good survival technician. Well, I don't really have anything else to say that hasn't already been said. I want to thank my wife for um, just putting up with me. And um, she was there with me the whole way, so thank you, baby. Thanks for everybody that came. I appreciate you guys coming. Fly safe. Be safe. When Coast Guard air crew members retire, they can request what they would like to do, and Petty Officer Bunch requested doing free fall deployments out of the back of the helicopter with his family and friends there so that they can see him do his last deployment. If I had anything to do over again, I don't think I would change a thing. I'm pretty happy with uh, my Coast Guard career. I thank the Coast Guard for all the opportunities that they provided me.
On my last deployment, it, was, it felt good. That was really when it hit me that this, this is really over. That was cool. <laughs> Pretty cool. Good show. What'd you think of that, buddy? Huh. You jumped in the water like that. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's right. There was a male out in False Pass. It was in pretty rough shape, severe pain, and they needed to get him out of there. I guess he crashed on his ATV. This four-wheeler accident wasn't just him kind of sliding and falling off. It was a good thing that we actually took off and came for him. 10 out of 10 for pain. The range is awesome. It's my favorite way to blow off steam from work. I noticed when I shoot, I'm basically stress-free for about six months. Getting all the information coming in, but it looks like we have a 30-year-old male He's in an ATV accident on um, one of the more isolated islands. He's over in False Pass. There is an unimproved runway there. However, we need to get a light flight into him, and they can't land on that smaller runway. Lieutenant Star Parmley, I'm an H-60 aviator here in Kodiak, Alaska. The alarm went off at 6 o'clock in the morning, and the ODO broke in over the beeper saying that there was a male out in False Pass that needed a medevac. He was in pretty rough shape, um, pretty messed up hip, severe pain, and they needed to get him out of there. 6006, Kodiak Air, you up on uniform? My name is uh, Lieutenant Jason Bustamante. I'm the ODO today. I received a call from District 17, and they wanted to stress that it was not a time-sensitive case. And the main reason they were stressing that was because of the uh, Pavlov volcano, which is just to the northeast of False Pass, is, has been erupting for three to five days. And volcanic ash is a very bad thing for a helicopter. Check. Ramp departure. 06 Air. Air 06. Hey, from uh, Ops, he wants you guys to stay on deck uh, momentarily until he gets in. Roger. They want us to stay on deck until the operations officer gets in. Gets to look at the weather. Uh, Lieutenant David Wright, uh, H-60 pilot here at Air Station Kodiak. We were ready and spinning. Got a call from the ODO saying, hey, hold on. Ops wants to check the, uh, the volcano status. Ensure that there was no ash in the atmosphere where we would be transiting. Uh, it's got the areas outlined. Mm -hmm. This is the path it's going to take based on the current weather, obviously. I can't really ever tell because the volcano could erupt like any minute, but uh, there's, it doesn't look like there's any ash currently in the area. Okay. A lot of people think it's just visibility that's restricted with an ash cloud, and it's a factor, of course. However, the volcanic ash is very caustic, and the smaller parts of the plane, especially in our turbine engines, the blades will get eaten up, we'll lose power, and obviously losing power when we need it to fly is a factor. Hey, uh, we got some updated weather and everything else, so uh, you guys are clear to launch. Uh, be advised, you could get winds up of uh, 35 knots. Thanks for the, uh, the update, appreciate it. And we are on the go. So uh, they'll pick the patient up in Falls Pass and transport to Cold Bay for awaiting transport to Guardian. Coast Guard Hilo 6006. Tom, we're taking off from Kodiak to Falls Pass for SAR. I would love to know if you have an ETA at the time. Oh. Falls Pass ETA is uh, 1045. Name's Nathan Fila, uh, aviation maintenance technician, second class. I'm a flight mechanic here at uh, Air Station Kodiak. We had real low visibility. The ceilings were below 300 feet, so we were, we were flying about 200 feet most of the way out there. And uh, the visibility was horrible, maybe a quarter mile of that. Weather was pretty bad. About five miles to the south of the air station at Cape Chiniac, we realized that the fog was starting there. We didn't know where it ended, and we were on instruments the whole way. We'll be at False Pass at 1945. 
Do we know if this guy's actually ambulatory? He's just injured, or is he actually laid out? His hip is hurt pretty bad, so I imagine. Yeah, he's laid out. Okay. Fox, he's taking you to the The patient is on a gurney and will need to be placed on a backboard for transport. He has been given eight milligrams of morphine via IV. IV line is still in place. He's needed to be given something along the way. Over. As we're getting closer to False Pass. Uh, we start getting more information from the ODL, so uh, being a swimmer, getting the cabin ready, and so we would be able to fit a litter in there. Did you really saw a review on uh, false pass? Okay, yeah, door speed. Yeah, you're at door speed. How did that come up? Hey, if you could back me up, you would probably kick up some sand. Roger that. It took us about five hours to get on scene, and once we got on scene, we landed at the little airport there. It's all pretty sturdy. Yep. Been around on the ground. You're good. Clear. I don't see anybody waiting for us. Hey, if you could back me up, you would probably kick up some sand. How did that? The alarm went off at 6 o'clock in the morning. There was a male out in False Pass that needed a medevac. He was in pretty rough shape, um, pretty messed up hip, severe pain, and they needed to get him out of there. I got a four-wheeler and a truck coming right now down the road. AST-1, Rashid Arnick, rescue swimmer, air station Kodiak. Once we landed, I got out, ran over to the medical care. When we uh, walked up to the ambulance, uh, they kept on telling us, do not touch his legs at all. He's very sensitive, he's in a lot of pain. So when we brought him to the cabin, we made sure not to touch his legs on anything. IV bag is hooked up. My first impression was, OK, this four-wheeler accident wasn't just him kind of sliding and falling off. His right side was banged up. His face had some blood on it still. He was banged up pretty good. So I knew that it was, uh, it was a good thing that we actually took off and came for him. It's going to be O2 form. Not much else I can do. Feet are real sensitive, so if we can avoid hitting those, that would be cool. But... Even though he was on morphine, he was still in uh, some pretty good pain. Did our basic uh, checks on him and uh, took off for uh, cold bay. OK, we're on the go. You think we're going to hit turbulence? Can you tell me? Roger. He's got an injury to his right side. You know, it could be anything from his femur, his hip, his arm. We, we don't know 100% of what's going on. I can evaluate all I want, but I don't have x-rays. So I still have to just do the best I can, keep him as comfortable as can, keep him alive as long as possible, and get him to a hospital. 10 out of 10 for pain. It looks like he smacked his face pretty good, too. I guess he crashed on his ATV, got back on, drove it all the way back to get help. When did it happen? 3.50 this morning. Ready for approach. Once we got to Colbay after the helicopter shut down, we were able to pull him out of the aircraft and we swapped him over to the Guardian's uh, backboard. Oh. It was a good thing we ended up taking off. He definitely needed to get to a higher level of care. We were all kind of beat, we were all kind of tired, but it's definitely another time where you just, you did your job and you're proud of it. You guys still set to take off? Yeah, we're ready, sir. This case was pretty awesome. A lot of planning went into it, and a lot of our skills were tested. And being able to help people when they need our help is really gratifying for me. It's very fulfilling. My name is Nick Nezeroff, and uh, from Keene Cove, Alaska. And I'm a commercial fisherman. I was riding my ATV on the road going to the boat harbor. And there, there's a construction site company working there in the harbor. And they had big steel beams out in the roadway. And they clipped one with the ATV. After I did x-ray and stuff, it was a broken femur. I could have died, because there's a main artery right there. If my leg would have just turned to the left or right, it would have punctured that main artery. I would have died in about two minutes. Pretty lucky to be here. Thanks to the Coast Guard for being there, because I probably wouldn't be here right now. Today I brought out 
a Remington 700 and 308 that I've done some modifications to. I brought out my Rock River 223 as well, and hopefully we'll go out to 500 and have some fun, blow some things up. Today I brought out a Glock 19. I brought out a MP5 clone. It's a copy of an HNK 9 millimeter. It's a short barreled rifle. I'm pretty excited just in general to go shooting again because I noticed when I shoot, I'm basically stress free for about six months. I enjoy shooting a lot and I do like hunting, but I only hunt for food. When I hunt for food, I also don't use a assault rifle. I always use a bolt action rifle, basically make it as humane and as fast as possible on the animal. It's a great thing. My family and I live off uh, all the meat that I get in the summertime. We live off that. We don't buy any meat in the stores. And it's all organic. You can't get any more organic than Alaska up here. It's, it's, it's amazing. Rasheed, get over here. Boom, boom time. So we have approximately seven pounds. We get tannerite. seven pounds in there. Seven pounds of Tannerite in an ammo can at 200 yards. It's a reactive target. Doesn't do anything until you hit it with a really high velocity bullet. It goes boom. Everybody ready? Yep. Firing. Yeah! <laughs> you got it. In case you were wondering. Oh, that's a good time. That was impressive. That's a nice capper. Yeah, that's pretty cool. That was nice. <laughs> the range is awesome. It's my favorite way to blow off steam from work. Mike's a, a big shooter, and so is Rashid. So when we get a chance to get together and come out here and just blow some things up, it's, it's really nice, especially when you got weather like this. You don't get too many days like this in Kodiak. came in was a 50-year-old male with internal bleeding on his upper gastrointestinal system. So we launched the 60 and the 1790. Tank Commander Tim Williams. I'm a H-60 uh, uh, helicopter pilot in Kodiak. When the call came in, it was roughly the middle of the day and the weather was good. The vessel is a container ship located about uh, 200 miles offshore of Kodiak. So typically in this long range SAR case scenario, we had the C-130 launch with us. Our two aircraft launched out of here. The 4-4 will hoist the patient and they'll be bringing back to Kodiak. It should be a normal evolution, but this being Alaska, everything always has its own take. Uh, about how long is the flight there? A little over two hours, about two and a half hours. Roger that. I'm HS2 Christina McRobert, and I am a corpsman here in Kodiak, Alaska. Preparing for a patient like this, you just need to make sure you have the right kind of gear. On the way out, we were just organizing stuff and making sure that everybody gets the right information and it gets taken care of. All right, Sarah, one half, we can do a litter and all that stuff, what we got? Yeah, we can do a litter. AET2 Joshua Harris. I'm a flight mechanic here at Air Station Kodiak. The C-130 usually gets on scene first. Obviously, they're a lot faster, so when they get there, they'll start talking with the boat crew about a hoist briefing and uh, just getting the best laid plans laid out so that we can start the hoist as soon as we get there. X-044 air. And uh, air 44 bit. Roger, be advised that during the night, he woke with a sense of drowning in blood on a pillow and found blood on his face, went to the bathroom, vomited more blood. He was found in bed complaining of pain in the stomach area. OK, Roger, good copy. Thanks for the update. No problem. At that point, all we knew that the guy had been vomiting blood for quite a few hours, so he needed to go to a higher level of care, get some tests done, and get taken care of. We got a visual. Roger. Three minutes out. Just under two hours transit to get on scene. The C-130 confirmed the uh, location of the vessel, so that way we didn't have to search for him. Costco, Long Beach. This is Coast Guard Rescue Helicopter, Channel 2 one Sir, this is Coast Guard Long Beach. Go ahead. Right, good afternoon, Captain. We're going to hover over the bridge wing to take a look at the area. Once we're done with that, uh, I'll give you a call on the radio, and then we'll actually hoist your crew member. Copy. I got a visual. Roger. We uh, received a call that there was an uh, individual on the uh, motor vessel uh, Costco Long Beach. 
He was suffering from a upper GI bleed. Good afternoon, Captain. We're going to hover over the bridge wing to take a look at the area. Once we're done with that, then we'll actually hoist your crew member. Copy. We could see that there was a, a decent hoisting platform. There was some railing on either side of it, so uh, you had to be direct with your aim. But it was better than I was expecting on, in route. So I was relieved to see it. If we wanted to, we could do this just straight up basket, and I'd feel fine with it. All right. With this situation, we elected not to put the swimmer down. The patient was ambulatory, which means they can walk uh, under their own power. So to save time, we just lowered the basket. In Costco, Long Beach from uh, Coast Guard Rescue Helicopter. Uh, we're ready to move in at this time, so uh, we'll lower down the basket. And uh, if you can help the patient in. It's understood. Target hit target in sight. Basket's going out the door. The railing made the, the hoist area just a little bit more narrow, so we had to put the basket right down in the middle without snagging it on either side. Over five and hold. Basket's on deck. Once that survivor climbs in the basket, it's usually frightening for them. There's a lot of wind. There's a lot of noise. They're way above the ground level. Bring the survivor into the cabin. And as they're coming in the cabin, that's the highest point of the job for me, making eye contact with them and giving them that reassuring grin of, hey, it's safe now. You're good to go. We're heading back. And Costco Long Beach from uh, Coast Guard Rescue Helicopter. We just want to expect our thanks and hope our patient is OK. It's our pleasure to come out and help. Thank you, sir. Uh, all the best to you. Once the patient got in the helicopter, it was just important to get his vitals, see where he was at. How's the patient doing? Patient, your blood pressure is quite high. It was 300 feet off the water, moving 100 miles an hour in a basket. Very funny. I was scared. And I saw how moving. Oh. He was a great, great patient. Just sat there, talked with us, joked around with us. I kept monitoring his vitals, and he was doing good and being in good spirits. How far were your tummy? I don't know, but last night it was terrible. And I don't know what happened from where coming, from the stomach, for the, for the lungs. For, I don't know, really, but at the pillow okay, it was completely flat. Once we got on scene, uh, we just landed right on the ramp. EMS was there to uh, meet us, and they uh, immediately took the patient to the hospital. Anytime that you can go out and just pick somebody up off a boat and get them back here much, much faster than they would have been able to before and potentially save a life like that, it's a really good feeling, and I'm always happy to be a part of it. Sonia Eskimi, I'm an Operations Specialist, third class petty officer here at Air Station Sitka. Right now, we just got a phone call for a 24 year old female who's having stroke symptoms. All we know so far is that she's on a cruise ship right now in Glacier Bay. Uh, it's a guaranteed hoist for us. The first uh, hoist that I do operationally um, for a case. So, a couple little things I got to think about for myself. Just. Uh, remembering my training. We have two flights that went out this morning. Uh, they are calling back the 6034. They're going to pick up a rescue swimmer and then take off to Glacier Bay to pick up the patient. With this specific case, we knew that she was a priority to get a higher level of care. This is my first hoist to a cruise ship, uh, medevacking someone off. I'm looking forward to the challenges I might face, and uh, I plan on overcoming them. Gentlemen, we can start taxiing. Lindsay, I was excited when you walked up. I'm obviously not a doctor. It seems like it's really young then to have a stroke. I wonder if there's an underlying issue, or have you heard anything else? No, sir, that's, uh, that's okay. exactly what I know. 24-year-old female, don't know when symptoms started. They're uh, requesting to get a medevac ticket to Juno. Roger that. Typically, the uh, weather in southeast Alaska is very cloudy, and it changes minute by minute. You can never really predict what the weather is going to look like, other than it's probably going to be bad. Yeah, it is pretty hard to tell what the weather's doing here. Yeah, it is. That looks like it's got a lot of, as you can see off the left, a lot of cloud over there. It'll probably save a little bit of time if it looks good going through the narrows and go over Bear Alley. The question is, is what is it like in Glacier Bay? Um, that is the question. One zero minutes from scene. We're going to start setting a litter up here. Good plan. 
My name is AMT-1 Chris Walker. I'm a helicopter flight mechanic here at Air Station Sitka. The rescue swimmer and the flight mechanic, we, we begin to prepare ourselves by just backing each other up, getting the cabin ready. So once we get there, in the heat of the moment, we're ready to go. Once you get a hold of this boat, roger that. Coral Princess, Coral Princess, Coast Guard Rescue 6034 on channel 16. Rescue 34, Coral Princess. Coral Princess, uh, I believe we have any answer sites. We'll uh, probably circle overhead uh, your vessel there uh, and try to locate uh, the best uh, hoisting option for us. Uh, Roger, if you need us to uh, change heading, let me know. Roger that. Weather absolutely beautiful. We got lucky with this one. Well, in this case, we were rather lucky. As soon as we got around the corner up into Glacier Bay, the world opened up. It was a beautiful, clear day. So some of my apprehension went away because anytime you can see what you're doing, all things are possible. Yeah, that actually does look really nice. What do you, uh, what do you guys think? I like it. That's a nice open area. What do you think, Monty? That looks good to me. We circled the cruise ship a couple times. Uh, some personnel on the boat had marked out a spot on the deck. Uh, we had a real good area to hoist to. How can you deliver the uh, litter? I'm just going to send the bear hook back up to you. Does that sound good? Yep, yep. Just give me the hook back, and, on, and, and, I'll, gonna, and I'll hold on to the tail line and the litter down there. And we'll be waiting for your call. Roger that. And I'll bring it somewhere to the door. Call Princess, Coast Guard Helicopter 3-4. We're going to be uh, beginning the hoist deliver the swimmer again. No assistance necessary. All right, sir. Swimmer is in the door. This will be my first operational hoist. I feel a lot of confidence in my flight mechanic and my air crew. Surface going down. Paul Princess, Coast Guard Helicopter 3-4. We're going to be uh, beginning the hoist deliver the swimmer again. No assistance necessary. We are responding to a medevac off a cruise ship up in Glacier Bay for a possible stroke patient. All right, sir, swimmer is in the door. This will be my first operational hoist. I've got a lot of confidence in my flight mechanic and my air crew. Surface going down. 92%, looking good. Roger. Right, 30. A little bit farther. Easy right. Your tail's clear. Summer's going down. Position's good. Altitude's good. One is on deck. Once I was on deck, I sent the hook back up to the helicopter with a trail line connected. And from that point, the flight mechanic hooked up the rescue litter. Once the litter was on deck, I uh, proceeded to go check on the patient. It may take him a little while to uh, package her up. Dave will go down and look at the patient, and he'll evaluate what is the best way to get this person up. In this case, we needed to put this victim into a litter, which stabilizes the patient, and that way we can bring them into the helicopter and get them to medical attention quickly. Rescue 3-4, the rescue swimmer. Rescue swimmer, 3-4. the patient packaged up on the litter. Uh, probably need about another five minutes here, and I'll signal to you when we're ready. The patient definitely needs to be taken a higher level of care. Hoisting her from a cruise ship, it was going to be a pretty high hoist. I wanted to make sure that we weren't going to have anything blowing around. I'm curious to know how she's doing. I hope she's OK. All right, he's giving me the uh, ready for pickup signal. On your target site. Looks coming down. Recovering the litter can be a little bit tricky. It is long, it's inflexible. Plus, you, of course, you have a patient in there. Take the load. Litter's coming up. Litter's clear in the vessel. You can move easy left, sir. Butter. Litter's coming up. Clear the easy left. All right, sir, I'll tell you what, hold right there. Just outside the cabin door. I'm positioner for uh, entry into the cabin. This girl, she was she was in the hurt, you know, and got her settled, uh, made sure she was okay, and then we uh, turned around and moved right back in for a pickup of the rescue swimmer. And hold position. Roger. With any patient we have, chances are it's one of the worst days of their lives. What we try and do is anything we can to keep them comfortable, whether it be 
giving them a thumbs up, uh, putting headphones on them so that they're not having to listen to the loud helicopter. We definitely try and do what we can. We put the life pack on her and we're monitoring her vitals. Um, her vitals are good. She was a rock star, so it was pretty easy just kind of sitting back and keeping an eye on her until we landed in Juno. Nice voice. Roger. I'm Natasha Daltrey. I'm from England, and I was working on the cruise ship in Alaska. I had a migraine all afternoon, and then I could feel the left side of my face droop. I ended up having a stroke, and I'm going to rehab now, and I'm going to try and make myself stronger. My name's Julie Daughtry, and my daughter's Natasha. We were really pleased when they told us that she was going to be airlifted, because obviously that meant that she could get medical attention much quicker. Basically, without them, who knows, she would not be here with us now. Coast Guard's a lifesaver. And without them, she wouldn't be here, probably. We'll never be able to say or do enough for that. But thank you very much. This is my second tour here. I, I was lucky enough to come back. It's the peak of your profession. Um, I came up here to be professionally challenged, and you are. Every day, you're professionally challenged. Whether it's the weather, the conditions of the patients, the long, enduring nights, it is the varsity of Coast Guard aviation. We have the best air crews in the world and they're stationed here at this air station. This is the team I want to go into battle with. These are the folks that I will risk my life and that of my crew into going into. I couldn't be prouder to be here.